Hello and welcome to this pre-recorded presentation about investigation on bridge from a global studies perspective. I'm a PhD student in the Open University in Portugal and my current investigation has to do with mind sports in competition, globalization and social political influence at the local level, the case of bridge. Some information about myself. My name is José Julio Curado, I'm 51. I'm a PhD student in Global Studies and I graduated in Social Sciences with a major in Political Science and Administration. I have some background in the exact sciences in Chemical Engineering. In Bridge, I started learning how to play Bridge in 1989. It's still a work in progress, like most Bridge players. I joined the Portuguese Bridge Federation in 1991. I became a TD and a Bridge teacher in 1996, which became my day job in about 16 years ago. And I'm an NBO International TD since uh, 2019. So why should I focus in a global studies perspective? Well, uh, more than an international game, Bridge is actually a global game. And by definition, global studies is the interdisciplinary study of global and micro processes less focused in the nation state as a fundamental analytical unit where compared to international relations, but more focused on the broader issues like economics, cultural globalization, global power structure, global governance, human effect on global environment, migrations, climate change. So everything together is a bit related to, to bridge, to be honest. For instance, characteristics of global studies that I think are also related to bridge have to do with transnationality. And again, we focus on global processes rather in the connection between individual states. And bridge is obvious a global sport, and we'll get into that later. But also, in this, when I say interdisciplinary, I mean politics, economics, history, geography, anthropology, sociology all go together as well as religion, technology, philosophy, health, environment, gender, ethnicity, and most of those uh, disciplines are also present in bridge as a field of interest for investigation. A few other characteristics of global studies, not so much related to bridge and to this investigation in particular, but they are also important, is that they're both contemporary and historical, meaning that the time span for global studies is basically the whole history, and post-colonial and critical theoretical, meaning that we also uh, often emphasize a post-colonial perspective and try to have multicultural lenses about almost everything. So the field of global studies revolves around the impacts of globalization in the growing interdependencies of states, economics, societies, cultures, people in general. Another interesting point is how bridge and social sciences relate. Well, in 1938, Johan Huizinga, a Dutch philologist, historian and scholar of play, wrote a book called Homo Ludens. In this, he discussed play as a formative element of culture, or in a simplistic way, culture before culture itself. Although Homo Ludens may be a little bit outdated today, and it's more of an essay than a real thorough uh, investigation on play and games. The definition that uh, Wiesinger gives us is very interesting. He says, play is a voluntary activity or occupation executed within certain fixed limits of time and place, according to rules freely accepted, but absolutely binding, having its same on itself and accompanied by a feeling of tension, joy, and the consciousness that this is different from ordinary life. So there are five important points here, which I think are very, very interesting. The first one is that play is voluntary. The second is that play is rule ordered. Hence, the rules are followed voluntarily as well. That play happens within fixed boundaries which we called the magic circle, that play is different from ordinary life and play in itself is not useful or of any material interest. Well, we may discuss this a little bit further, but those are the basic things 
to do with play and the definition of play. Uh, the magic circle is a very key point here. It's a type of social space separating time and space where the play takes place. The magic circle is so important that according to Wiesinga, we're very likely to regard the cheater more leniently than we do with the sport, because the sport shatters the, per the, the play world itself, it robs play of illusion, while the cheater is still within the magic circle at some point. So, and this is very important, Bridge enjoys a global playing base and infrastructure comparable to any traditional sport. And the magic circle of bridge is porous. And this is something we're going to get back later on. This is Professor Raul Kumar in the, from the University of Coimbra, where he lectures teams related to sociology, international relations, history of sports, press, uh, transnational history, sociology of culture, and so he has a bit of transdisciplinarity in itself and in, within its interests. And one of them is sports, as I told you. And he defines sports as a modern tradition created from the second half of the 19th century, mostly by the elites in the UK universities. He also argues that sports became popular throughout the 20th century, spreading to all social classes to a point where they became forms of representation of social and political identification especially in the affirmation of the new nation state in the international arena. He also says that it's not surprising that the global diffusion of sports can be traced closely to geography of the British colonial economic and political interests. So even if sports are quite recent, card games have been around for a long time. They were part of European culture since the 15th century. Whist was around by the 16th century. The Hoyle's Troll Treatise uh, is a book published on Whist and was published in 1742. Uh, Whist Bridge, which is a form of a partnership game, was played in the Bosphorus by the end of the 18th century. And there were tournaments uh, designed by uh, J.T. Mitchell by 1892 in a book published in 1892 in New York. Uh, Auction Bridge was introduced in the early 20th century and by the end of the First World War uh, in France, the platform bridge was around, which means that we were playing forms of early bridge or pre-bridge games before bridge itself, almost in both in Europe and in the United States at least. In 1925, we had uh, Harold Vanderbilt playing contract bridge and having the Portland Club of London, the Whist Club of New York, and the Commission, uh, the Commission Française de Bridge, uh, publishing and accepting the bylaws, which were pretty much global. In 1927, Elie Coubertson started a diffusion of uh, bridge, uh, make it e even more global. And in 1929, he created the, the bridge world, which is still around today. The International Bridge League was created in 1932 in Scheveningen in Holland, where it uh, organized the first European Championships and the first World Team Championships. The ACBL was created in 1937, but it was not uh, until the end of the Second World War, in 1947, that the EBL, the European Bridge League, was created. And the World Bridge Federation, which now supervises World Bridge, was created in uh, 1958. Bridge can be considered a global mind sport. It enjoys a global playing base and infrastructure comparable to any traditional sport, said Peter Stockdale, EBU communication manager. The WBF now comprises 103 countries and growing, divided into eight zones, Europe, North America, South America, Asian and the Middle East, Central American and Caribbean, Asian Pacific, South Pacific, and Africa. Bridge is also part of the International Mind Sports Association, which was established in 2005. Uh, Bridge is one of the founding members. 
because there are other mind, global mind sports with organized competition. Besides bridge, we have chess, droughts, Federation of Card Games, Go, Mahjong, and Chianki, all are organized competitions and in a global way. So among all mind sports, is bridge a mind sport for all? Well, I think the answer is a clear yes. Mind sports in general are less circumscribed by gender, age, ethnicity, religion, and physique. So we all compete together, we all compete against each other. Uh, but bridge is also improving teamwork skills. The player needs to depend on information from his or her partner before making decisions. So bridge is both competitive and cooperative and it teaches how to trust and communicate with others for mutual gain. Bridge is also a very important in terms of health, because as the Journal of Gerontology was published in a few years ago, uh, bridge players outperform non-players in measures of working memory and reasoning. <clears throat> they also show lower risks of dementia, and in an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, uh, we came to the conclusion that bridge stimulates the thymus gland, which produces blood T cells, the, the blood white cells, thus enhancing the immune system itself. So it's not only enjoyable, but good for your health as well. So bridge is definitely a mind sport for all. But is it a mind sport for all at all levels? A few years ago, I came across this book that most of you have probably read or heard about, and it was a real eye-opener for me. This is Why Women Lose at Bridge, a book by Jane Nicholson, published in 1985, on the reasons for being so difficult for women to reach the top in international competition. So as a spoiler alert, and the general conclusions are that time and money are of the essence to become a very competent player, and women have less time and less money than men, the other reason might be because of upbringing. Sometimes women are less confident, less used to make decisions, and this has to do with education. And the final ones they have to do with attitudes towards women from men. Male players don't often invite uh, female players to play. They don't value them as much as other uh, male players. And this is something that was, was a bit odd 35 years ago. We're no longer in 1985. But there is still something we should do about it. We should do more to promote women and to make them more powerful players as uh, everybody else. How can we do it? We can use sports as soft power. Soft power works through persuasion. The goal is to convince in a non-coercive manner another political actor to want the same things that we do. And it works through four mechanisms. Image building, building a platform for dialogue, trust building, and reconciliation, integration, and anti-racism, for instance. Here you can see three examples. One international in foreign policy, where China and the United States got along through the ping-pong diplomacy in the 70s that ended up with Nixon visiting China. On your right, on the top right, you can see the women's team of the Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, a basketball team that has been allowing women to gain their own voice through sports. And in the lower uh, left, on the lower right, you can see South African President Nelson Mandela handing over uh, the William Ellis Cup to the spring captain Francois Pinard after the 1995 Rugby World Cup over New Zealand. And this was a fundamental moment for the Union of South Africa. So sports can really effectively be used as soft power. Both the United Nations and the International Olympic Community know that. That's why they signed this memorandum of understanding in 2017. By then, the president, Mr. Thomas Bach, told, with this memorandum of understanding, we will build on our efforts already underway to promote access to sport for girls and work towards gender equality. And the United Nations Women Executive Director from Jill Blambon Guka told that sport is an invaluable tool to equip women and girls with leadership skills, reduce marginalization, 
and dismantle stereotypes. That means that they both fall in the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goal 5. They recognize this sport as an important enable for sustainable development, in particular in growing contribution for empowerment of women and young people, individuals and communities, as well as health, education and social inclusion object objectives. So sport is really a good tool for empowering women and young girls. But not, that's not all. Like for instance, this girl, Malala. She says that life skills, education, leadership opportunities, and extracurricular activities like sport after at an early age and through adolescence are essential for the empowerment of girls and women, enabling them to take control of their education of health and health. 75% of the girls active in sports programs identify themselves as leaders compared to just 31% of girls not in the program. This means that leadership can be trained. Bridge is essential in that because it trains decision-making on incomplete information. If young girls are taught bridge, they are taught to make decisions, and if they say, and sooner or later, they will be proficient in decision-making, becoming better leaders in the world. And let's get back to the magic circle. You remember, this is a type of social space separate in time and space and where all play takes place. Listening, etiquette, concentration, dealing with winning and losing, and many other social skills can be enhanced by playing bridge inside the magic circle. And these competences and abilities learned inside the magic circle can be applied outside as well. For instance, the ability to adapt or adjust the plan when additional information becomes available, informational thinking, is something that you learn inside the magic circle of bridge. And magic circle, we know, is portals in both directions, meaning that we can influence the magic circle from the outside but things and abilities learned in the outside can be brought on the outside as well. Coming close to the end of our presentation, I think that bridge is a serious investigation field. Professor Samantha Punch and the BAMSI team have proved that bridge is a rich transdisciplinary field for investigation in social sciences, sociology, anthropology, political science, economy, and now we can add global studies. So the final question or a new starting point, we started by asking, can bridge be of interesting way to promote a more inclusive, fair and cohesive society and at the same time increase longevity and social well-being? And I think we can answer this first question with a firm yes. But maybe we can improve this question slightly and start thinking about the new investigation. How can we make reach an interesting way to promote a more inclusive, fair and cohesive society and at the same time increase longevity and social well-being? So this is a question not of if, but of how we can do it. So thank you very much for staying with me until the end of this presentation. I hope to see you soon in the conference in the end of June. Goodbye.